Welcome to the 80th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Christopher Farnsworth, author of the President's Vampire series. Christopher's latest novel is Red, White, and Blood. I wanted to ask again at the beginning, if you have listened to this podcast and found it enjoyable or found it valuable to your interest in writing or reading, if you could take two to three minutes and leave me a review on iTunes, it means other people can have a chance of finding the podcast within iTunes. Uh, the review process on iTunes is very simple. You just find the podcast and hit the review button and write a quick review. And of course, your efforts will be appreciated. Thanks a lot and stay tuned for the interview. And welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Christopher Farnsworth, author of the new novel Red, White, and Blood, the latest novel about Nathaniel Cade, the president's vampire. Christopher, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much. I really appreciate you having me, Jeff. Sure, sure. Well, first I wanted to see if you could uh, read the first three or four paragraphs of your new novel Red, White, and Blood. Uh, absolutely. It gets a little blue. So, you know, put the kids to bed and, uh, and uh, draw the shades. Um, <laughs> but it starts uh, June 23rd, 1975, Ojai, California. Jenny straddled Tom's lap in the back seat, her tongue deep in his mouth. The eagles wailed on the radio. He lifted his hands under her blouse to her breasts. She ground herself into his crotch and he let out a groan. Tom's erection threatened to tear through the zipper of his pants. They'd been here so many times before. He knew he'd have to stop soon. Tom and Jenny came to the overlook near the creek bridge every night now. They didn't even make the pretense of going out to the movies or out for a burger. Just a few hours of dry humping and kissing before curfew. Then Jenny, as if an alarm clock went off in her head, would pull back and rearrange her clothes, put her bra back on, and tell him to start driving home. Tom thought he'd explode if this kept up much longer, but he forced himself to stay patient. As frustrated as he got, Jenny was the hottest chick he'd ever seen, let alone touched. Unlike se most 17-year-old guys, he could be a little patient. Tom wasn't about to blow this chance. Great. Well, if the listeners haven't heard about your new novel, Red, White, and Blood yet, can, can you describe what the novel is about? Right. Well, uh, basically, uh, Nathaniel Cade is the president's vampire. He's a secret agent who's been working for the United States president for uh, the last 145 years. And uh, he's able to do that because he's also a vampire. And he was uh, an ordinary sailor who uh, was found on a fishing boat drinking uh, the, uh, the remains of uh, the blood of two of the bo from the bodies of two of his friends. And instead of having him destroyed, the president at the time, Andrew Johnson, offered him a chance to essentially work off uh, his sin, uh, to take an oath to serve the presidency and the United States. And that's what he's been doing ever since. He's the, the first response and the last line of defense against all of the uh, nasty things that go bump in the night out there. And that's his job. And in this installment of the, the books, he comes up against a guy he's faced before uh, who's called the Boogeyman. And the Boogeyman is real, and the Boogeyman is essentially the animating force behind serial killers. Um, so that's what happens to Tom and Jenny in a, in a few moments. This guy, the Boogeyman, is the source of all urban legends and all of the slasher and the ideas behind slasher films. And in a few minutes, they're about to meet the Boogeyman because, of course, they're the teenagers who are out on the out on the ridge who uh, encounter the uh, the maniac. And what Cade, uh, what eventually happens in the book is that Cade has to protect the president himself from the boogeyman who has decided that uh, he wants to become a presidential assassin as well as just a, a mad lunatic slasher. Great. Well, you've written three books now about Nathaniel Cade, and I'm sure you're very aware of the enduring popularity of vampires in, in fiction and in movies and popular culture. Why do you think people continue to enjoy and remain fascinated with the vampire myth? I think, I think vampires, yeah, have become a genre unto themselves. And I think people are fascinated by it, especially right now, because there are a lot of things that are scaring us. And whenever the outside world gets scary, we turn to uh, horror movies. 
we turn to familiar myths and folklore to make some sense of it. Um, I think that's what I really like about writing Cade is that he is he's part of that darkness, but he's also on our side and he is our chance to bite back against all of the, the evil forces out there. You know, you can't you can't really uh, punch out a mortgage foreclosure and you can't fight unemployment, you know, yourself. But what you can do is you can watch a movie about zombies getting their heads blown off or you can you know read about uh, a vampire who works for the president who fights all those things for us. And I think that's I think that's one reason the scary things in fiction are so popular and so enduring is that they give us a manageable fear. Sure, sure. That's uh, I think you're right about that. Uh, do uh, Do you remember the initial spark for the idea of Nathaniel Cade and, and the idea, the the concept of the president having a, a vampire? Oh yeah, absolutely. The um, the incident I told you about with the sailor and President Andrew Johnson is actually based on a real incident in U.S. history. Uh, there was a newspaper clipping. Um, from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle that talked about a, a human vampire and a murderer, uh, a sailor who was found on a whaling vessel drinking the blood of two of his companions. And he was sentenced to be hanged, but for some reason, President Johnson, who's the president who followed Abraham Lincoln after Lincoln was assassinated, pardoned him, and nobody really knew why. Um, but I just the, the idea itself was fascinating to me. I thought, what if this guy really were a vampire? What if what if you know everything else was just a cover story, and the president of the United States discovered an actual vampire, and what would he do with it? And then of course the next question from there was, well, what wouldn't he do with it? <laughs> um, and this would become you know a weapon in our arsenal uh, against the supernatural. That if if vampires existed, then naturally so did everything else, and. Uh, so did all the other monsters out there, and the United States uh, would want some sort of defense against this. And I think that that's that's where that's where Cade started right there. He you know he became uh, that's just where the idea began, and he became our defense against uh, against all the boogeymen. True. So what, what was your path to publication like as a novelist? I've read that you worked both as a journalist and then as a screenwriter in Hollywood. What led you to writing the first Nathaniel Cade novel, Blood Oath? Well, I always wanted to be a writer. I always wanted to be a novelist. I, you know, ever, as, Even before I really had any idea of what that meant as a kid, I wanted to write books. and uh, But I also had to make a living. And so, you know... I, I ended up becoming a reporter, and, and I enjoyed it, and I was, I was pretty good at it, um, I was, or, I was, or at least pretty okay at it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but then I was, I was working on uh, some, other, some other ideas, and uh, a friend of mine, this is back when I was still a reporter, a friend of mine was a screenwriter, and he said, books? Pfft, nobody reads books. You've got to write movies now. And so I, uh, I wrote a script, and I got very lucky, and it sold in just a couple of weeks. But my agents told me, you know, this was never going to happen this fast for you again. And they were <laughs> right. Uh, and after a few years of flailing away at, uh, at Hollywood, um, the writer's strike hit just about the same time I had the idea for uh, Nathaniel Cade. And my agents hated that idea. And so I decided, well, you know, this is my Hail Mary pass. This is what I'm going to, this is the idea I'm going to, you know, choose to go out on if it's, if this is the last thing I write. Uh, so I'm going to write it as a book and see what happens. And from there, it was just the usual uh, grueling uh, search for an agent. And uh, I got very lucky there. I got, found an agent in Alexander Machinist who, um, you know, believed in the property and was willing to take a chance on it. And we got incredibly lucky. Um, or at least I got incredibly lucky. I think she worked really, really hard. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was just it was just the grind of sending out queries, writing up the book. I didn't have any backdoors or uh, any um, any contacts to exploit. I I put, went into the whole situation blind. So, do you remember why your film agents hated the idea? They said that vampires were over. Ah. They said, that uh, this was about two or three weeks before Twilight came out. <laughs> that nobody wanted to, nobody wanted to hear about vampires anymore. So, yeah, yeah. I guess you and, know a couple a couple of weeks ago they were probably saying, "Oh, superhero movies. Who needs those?" Exactly, exactly. That would be about the right time. <laughs> about the right time. And actually, I think though you'll find that. I mean, everybody will. 
there's there's always a rush to to, to declare anything over. I think sure, that sure. people right after uh, right after the latest X Men movie and Ghost, the last Ghost Rider film, you saw a bunch of those trend pieces which said, "Is the superhero film, is the comic book film over?" It's like, no, of course it's not. Uh, you know, the Avengers just had the biggest opening weekend in hit ever. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it all depends on the characters and the story and the execution. Yeah. Um, I like to think that that's the same for vampires. Sure. So and people will say the vampires are over until Twilight, uh, the next Twilight movie comes out and makes you know half a billion dollars too. Exactly. Exactly. So, so what's the pro- writing process like for you? Do you outline your novels extensively, or do you write more organically? Uh, I do outline them now. I used to write more organically. I would, you know, write until I came to a, a point where I couldn't think of what else was going to happen. I would paint myself into a corner and then try to figure out a way to fly Cade and the other characters out, um, which was which was a lot of fun. But it also led to great big points of me just staring at the computer screen until drops of blood appeared on my forehead. Uh, now that I'm trying to write at least one book a year, I just don't have the time for that. So I try to I try to get that I try to get that process out of the way by outlining, by figuring out, by throwing my characters into as deep of trouble as possible and then coming up with the solutions in the outline. And, um, you know, it's, it's a little, I guess it's a little less fun, but it, it certainly does, it certainly, I think, saves time. Sure. I finally understand why, why all of my English and professors said you really should outline first. <laughs> because I was... I would I would write the the outline the rough draft and the final paper all on the same day and it just it drove my my teachers nuts. <laughs> uh, now, now I... So so um, given your your novel a year pace, uh, are you are you planning to continue Nathaniel Cade or do you have other ideas that you might want to explore? Uh, both actually, I um, I have uh, I have just finished. Uh, a crime novel that uh, my agent and I are going to try shopping around. Um, but I do want to continue doing the Cade series. I've got, when I first sold it, I had, they asked, you know, for as many ideas as I could come up with. And I think I've got 10 solid ideas for books that'll tell the whole story and that will answer any of the questions that I've, that I've raised up. And I think that it'll, um, I think it will all come together by, by book 10 um, as and hopefully there'll be space in there to do other projects as well. I've had, I've got other ideas. I've, I'm working on a, an idea for a guy who's the smartest man in the world and, uh, and how he deals with his particular, uh, mission in life, which is to solve world ending problems. Uh, the kind of problems that usually end with a mushroom cloud and a very large bang. And that's his job. Um, so yeah, I want to, I want to put that sort of stuff together at the same time. That's great. Well, given your success with writing uh, and, and publishing the, the three Nathaniel Cade novels that are out now, what tips or advice would you offer for aspiring writers? The main one, and I've said this before, is just never be ashamed of your enthusiasms. It took me a long time to learn this, but you should write what you want to write. You should write it's it's more than just write what you won't know because obviously I don't know that there's a, a classified vampire uh, working for the president. But um, my my daily life would probably be a lot more interesting if that were true. <laughs> but uh, it's write what you want to write. Right? What I was ashamed of my enthusiasm for the longest time. I loved comic books. I loved uh, superheroes and horror movies and sci-fi and all those things and all those things were not considered serious and they weren't considered proper subjects for a writer um and even now you know you'll have people say oh well you know i i I just i do that you know i do that stuff and that's fun but my real work is is you know these grim little novels set in new england college towns Uh, i don't i don't buy that distinction anymore i um I just think that you have to write what you love. And if what you love writing is literary fiction, then God bless you because you're better at it than I am. And uh, I can't do that. I need, you know, maybe it's a sign of my childishness, but I need explosions and I need uh, things, you know, going off and, uh, and uh, people who can fly. Sure. And that's the stuff that I love. And that's the stories that I want to, I want to write about and I want to tell. So, 
yeah, that's the most important piece of advice, I think. If you write something because you feel like you have to or you feel like that's uh, the the prevailing trend or you feel like you're writing something for the that the audience wants to see that you don't want to, then it's going to be terrible and you're not going to be happy with it. Um, and if it doesn't sell or it doesn't get read by anyone, that, that will probably be why. But if you want to write the next great exploding zombie movie or the next great uh the next great vampire story and you can do it in a way that's new and interesting even though you know there are tons of people working in the field then that's what you should do you should you should make it as good as you possibly can so that people will want to read it no matter what that, I think that's great advice. So, so what what books, fiction or nonfiction, have you have you read lately that you that you would recommend that that really made an impact or or that really impressed you? I just finished uh, Nick Harkaway's The Gone Away World, and it just blew me away. I was just I was so impressed with it, and I was so uh, jealous. I mean, I uh, it just it's it's touching and funny and bizarre and smart and tragic and has explosions and has you know uh, everything you could imagine in in the book he's just crammed it so full of so much stuff and i was just um i was just uh, thrilled and impressed by it um i was even i i seriously i was reading it on my book tour and i was seriously considering reading parts of that to people, my audiences because i was like this is just so great guy <laughs> you got to read it uh, what what was the title i i, I missed it Nick Harkaway is the Gone Away World. Okay. And it's about the aftermath of what's called the Go Away War, um, and some 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 bad mistakes with quantum physics uh, lead to essentially the end of the world, and then things get really interesting. And plus, there's there's ninjas and uh, um, and it's uh, you know also a touching coming of age story, and there's uh, uh, you know twists and. Uh, monsters it's just it's remarkable um i also uh recently finished uh zach parsons liminal states which is uh about two guys who discover um well essentially the secret to eternal life uh they start out in the old west and it's about how their mere presence distorts the whole world around them and how they're and their enmity, uh, their their hatred for one another, um, haunts them out through their their various uh, through all their their long incarnations. And it's really it's another really fascinating and incredibly well written book. And then of course I always read uh, Lee Child. Uh, the Jack Reacher series is fantastic. I read Neil Gaiman. Uh, pretty much anything he does. Um, John Connolly's books. I'm always ready for the next in his Charlie Parker series. Uh, just yeah ton of stuff but i really yeah those are the those are the books that those two books have really stood out to me and i just i can't wait to 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 read more stuff like that that's great well where can people find you online uh you can go to my website at presidentsvampire.com or chrisfarnsworth.com it'll take you to the same place and you can read the first chapter of each book there's also a ton of deleted scenes and extras um, so you can, if you haven't read the books yet, you can get plenty of, plenty of free samples, I believe, and try before you buy. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Christopher Farnsworth. His latest Nathaniel Cade novel, Red, White, and Blood, is available in bookstores now. Christopher, thanks for doing the interview. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff. I appreciate it. Almost 90% of women have cellulite. And guess what? It's not their fault. We don't choose cellulite, but we can choose a different way to treat it. Meet Quo, Collagenase Clostridium Histolyticum, AAES, the first and only FDA-approved prescription injectable for moderate to severe cellulite in the buttocks of adult women. This non-surgical treatment is injected by an aesthetic specialist in 10 minutes or less. Individual results may vary. Do not receive if you are allergic to any collagenase or ingredients in Quo. 
quo or have an infection at the treatment site. May cause serious side effects, allergic reactions including anaphylaxis and injection site bruising. Seek medical help right away for any signs of allergic hypersensitivity. Tell your doctor about all your medical conditions, if you have a bleeding condition or take medicine that prevents clotting. Most common side effects include bruising, pain, hardness, itching, redness, discoloration, swelling and warmth at the injection site. Ask your doctor about all possible side effects and for product information. If you're ready to get to the bottom of your cellulite, learn more and find a specialist at quo.com.